Welcome to Jive Talk. Today, I have a guest, Ben Elliott, a historian and a filmmaker like myself, who has a special interest in an archaeological culture that is probably one of the most important archaeological cultures in the history of the world, but many people don't even know about it, surprisingly. And Ben's done a lot of good work to try and end that. Uh, ben, welcome to Jive Talk. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me to your home. You have these beautiful artifacts here, which mm -hmm. you've made as recreations of the uh, those that come from the Vincha culture. So, Ben, what's the Vincha culture? Okay. So, Vincha culture is a culture that has effectively emanated from the Balkans, which is in southeastern Europe, and it dates to roughly around 5300 BC. Its relevance and its importance, though, is in it is the first manifestation of the Neolithic on that scale in European history. It's the first of its type. Mm -hmm. And what categorizes the Neolithic in general, just in case people don't know, is fixed settlements and agriculture. They're the fundamental tropes. And when you look at venture culture across the board, across the entire area of the Balkans in which you find them, you find that it, uh, that high degree or that high level of Neolithic development. And that covers not just the, in, the tropes I, I, uh, uh, um, I highlighted, but also industrialized ceramic manufacturing and even copper metallurgy way before the Neolithic period. Yeah, and that's something really interesting because the Anatolians who left Anatolia and triggered the Neolithic in Europe around 8,000 years ago, um, Within seven thousand years, that um, by, I'm sorry, within a thousand years, uh, they're in this area of the Balkans, mainly Serbia, correct? Mainly centered in Serbia, but um, even into Croatia, Slovenia, Kosovo, Bosnia, Montenegro, Macedonia, northern Greece, parts of southern Hungary, and even parts of Romania and Bulgaria. It's mm. that pervasive. Cool. Yeah, wow. yeah, it does expand quite a lot. Yeah. Uh, that whole region, and they've got beautiful. Uh, anthropomorphic figures and zoomorphic figures um, in clay. They're producing enormous amounts of pottery and they have metallurgy. Whereas the Anatolian, like European Anatolians elsewhere who spread across the continent going, you know, as far as Scandinavia and the British Isles. I mean, um, they didn't even get to the British Isles until like 6,000 years ago or something. And I mean, 7,000 years ago in in most of Europe, they didn't have any metal. They weren't doing metallurgy. And in fact, like 6,000 years ago, still no metallurgy. Uh, 5,000 years ago, most of Europe had no metallurgy. But the Balkans had copper working way before the rest of Europe, very early. In fact, not just before the rest of Europe, but if I'm not correct, you're saying before the rest of the entire world. Not necessarily before the rest of the entire world. Uh, the, the significance of Vincia is that although copper metallurgy does pop up in other parts of the world prior to Vincia, Vincia discovers it autonomously. So it's actually the autonomous discovery of copper by very early Neolithic Europeans. Mm. That is the, uh, that's the remarkable thing. And how they discovered it autonomously is part of a very rich uh, debate, which I'm, unfortunately I don't think we've got time for, mm -hmm. but, we know that they were discovering copper very, very early because of the Neolithic copper mines that we find. And Locally, they're not importing their-, their They're not stuff. importing it, they're actually making it themselves and they're trading in the raw ores. So azurite and malachite. So they know what they're looking for. They, mm. have, um, they have mining practices and then they have practices for smelting, which ties in with um, pyrotechnology. Mm. So to smelt metals, it's at a lower temperature than it is to fire ceramics. So these people are more than capable of uh, creating copper. Mm. And uh, they're trading the raw ores and they use all of the waterways across the Balkans, Sava, Danu, Morava, and so on. So they're able to, sh to spread that technology on, you could call them the equivalent of RM1, where all the lorries ferry goods up and down the country uh, they have their own versions of the M1, which are these these waterways. Is it possible, correct me if I'm wrong, that the, the the learning to smelt and work with metals 
is likely somehow connected to their uh, enormous production of ceramics. So they were used to you having furnaces and things like that, and this kind of in this, in this technology and almost industrial level production is would have aided a transition to a, a different mode of production with metals. Quite possibly, quite possibly. Did they discover it by accident? I, I wouldn't want to hazard a guess. But when you look at sites, there's some very important venture sites. One's called Plochnik. Mm -hmm. And when they were going through the stratigraphy or all the different horizons and the, the, the cultural layers of the site, which is a venture site, uh, they discovered copper in the very earliest layers. Mm -hmm. And a lot of academics at the time basically said, no, 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 no. It's fallen through the layers over time. They didn't have access to it. But now the modern interpretation of that data uh, is that, no, actually... They had copper from the almost the outset of uh, the founding of the culture itself. That's incredible, uh, and maybe in instrumental in the foundation of the culture somehow. Quite possibly, they, there's one theory that I'm inclined towards, uh, though I, I probably need to do a little more research on it. But they actually think that copper is one of the primary materials that created a class-based system in that culture. I think that's highly plausible. Um, it, it's certainly the case in, in the British Neolithic, mm -hmm. or like the in, in Neolithic, like with the uh, from uh, four and a half thousand years on onwards, mm -hmm. that the the first people to possess have to be buried with metal items are high status, and the more high status they are, the more metal items they are buried with. So it, they, that's a long time later, and it's an obvious conclusion to make. Mm -hmm. And of course, the oldest uh, known example of gold. Uh, working uh, I'm aware of is the Varna culture which is mm -hmm. also in the Balkans mm -hmm. and just comes slightly after the Vinci culture it's, sli it's slightly to the east of it and slightly after so very likely the Varna culture has some cultural relationship to the preceding Vinci culture and they are the gold within that culture is certainly status say, it always has been and that you have these you know very wealthy burials of people with gold items mm -hmm. uh, and interestingly the the Varna culture does have, in my knowledge, cultural connections and similarities to things on the other side of Neolithic Europe in France, where similar sim symbols that have been made of gold by Varna are being carved onto rocks in France. And uh, the same Italian jadeite axe heads that the f they're being exported from uh, the Italian Alps to Western France and Scotland even, are also being exported to the Varna culture in the Balkans. Do we know whether the Vinci culture also had any kind of long distance connections uh, in Europe or elsewhere? Well, fundamentally, at its core, the Neolithic technologies that they had were in, uh, essential to the spread of that technology across the rest of Europe. It's basically farmers. Uh, we always like to sort of sensationalize and romanticize Mesolithic peoples. Mm -hmm. um, but really, um, the venture people being near of, of the Neolithic epoch, uh, their technologies that they had spread across Europe and displaced and pushed to the peripheries Mesolithic people. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that they've they've um, that they've got in, term, in, in terms of that. Mm -hmm. um, what else would there be? I mean, there's always a transmission of uh, cultural symbols and things like that. So when you look at altars, ceramic altars, you find horned animals which could be maybe something like a goat or an ibex and we've we had that conversation before mm -hmm. and you see images of ibex spreading across certainly parts of eastern europe mm -hmm. so i think there's an inheritance on that front as well mm -hmm. and i would say copper metallurgy as well yeah yeah, yeah. you remember where you say that there's somewhere else that has earlier metal uh, evidence of metallurgy than vintage culture do you mm -hmm. know where that is it would be in Anatolia. It is in Anatolia, and I believe the culture is. I think it's Chattelhoyuk. I okay. think, but yeah. the far later stages of Chattelhoyuk, because that was founded, as far as we know, around seven thousand four hundred BC. Mm -hmm. So it comes after like Gobekli Tepe, yeah, and things like that, which is a pre-pottery culture. Yeah, but we do we do see uh, copper in the Near East. I should <sighs> add that the 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 Europe the early Neolithic Europeans who left Anatolia that came from Western Anatolia and they were related to the people who made Cattle Hoyuk. 
Mm -hmm. So uh, not so much Gebergli Tepe, but perhaps more distantly to Gebergli Tepe. But the, there is a cultural relationship between them. But it does just seem strange that uh, so early in the migration into Europe, you have this quite advanced venture culture. Completely. Then the rest of Europe doesn't share in uh, most of the advancements that mm. it makes. It's worth bearing in mind that if you've got farming peoples coming from Anatolia into the Balkans, they're going there for one essential reason. Farmland. Farmland. Yeah. Exactly. That's it. It's yeah. the quality of the soil. It's the reason the Romans went there. And mm. it's the reason that even today in Croatia, Serbia, even Romania and places like that, and Bulgaria, they produce some of the best wine mm -hmm. in Europe. And yet, well, we don't see any of it here, do we? No. It's a funny thing. It's a sort of, uh, yeah. you know, you can see it's sort of a bit of history repeating itself on, on, on that front. But they've got, got just such good quality soil there it makes perfect sense that you've got Anatolian farmers coming into the region and thinking, um, it's actually quite nice here. <laughs> I'm, I'm aware that the the farmers who the first farmers who uh, who travelled up the Danube from the Balkans into Central Europe mm -hmm. were limited in the regions of their expansion to those places that had lowest soils, which sure. was the kind that the soil that was required for the kind of farming that they were able to do at that time. Farming was in its infancy, and many of the techniques that people now have didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So they, they they needed the specific kind of soil. Was that limitation also the case in the Balkans with the vincher culture? To a certain extent. To a certain extent, you notice that when you find a vincher settlement, it has to almost be by water. Mm -hmm. If it's not, and you do uh, and you do the relevant studies on the, the geography of that area, you can see that they would have at once at one point been a waterway of some description mm -hmm. it's why you find them clustered and when i say clustered we're talking hundreds of sites mm -hmm. clustered all along the marava valley mm -hmm. it's absolutely essential and one of the big sites which is um it's a tell site and it's also a type site is the site of bella brodo which is just outside of um, belgrade which is the capital of serbia uh same thing same thing essential to have these waterways um obviously for trade but that's where you get these extremely rich hinterlands. Mm. It's, uh, and yeah, that's exactly what they're looking for. Mm. So why is it that people don't know about the vintage culture yeah. and what are you doing to change it? I'm not entirely sure why people don't know enough about it. Uh, I think when you look at the development, and I won't get into this in too much detail, but when you look at the development of historical na narratives within uh, Western academia, mm. it does tend to focus pretty predominantly on Greece and Rome and other cultures that are more specific to the now emerged nations that they now belong to. Okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so for example, we're we're fairly uh, we're fairly well versed on Anglo-Saxon culture in England as well as Romano-British culture. But would you know anything about uh, uh, you know the uh, the Roman cultures of Serbia? No, and it's because it's sort of unique to that region. Mm. When it comes to Vincha, though, I think the European narrative, when it comes to history, trying to present European narratives is actually quite difficult because when you look at that region, there are so many small scale cultures that you could study. Mm. And when you look at the conflicts and the, the tumultuous nature of the Balkans, again, without getting into that, that's a whole subject, all of it. So yeah. I'm you, sure the comments section will have plenty it'll of be that. Full of it. <laughs> when you look at it that way, that region has got such a bad reputation yeah. that anything coming out of there is either in dribs and drabs or people are uh, people just don't think anyone's going to be interested because mm. who would be interested in the Balkans mm. that's the and that's the attitude I've picked up from a lot of fellow academics in those parts of the world really they uh, seem surprised that people would be interested in this that's a shame mm. but do you think that people in the Balkans Serbia specifically where you've traveled a lot mm -hmm. are all very aware and, and and conscious of the the significance of the venture culture those who study it are but the general public aren't Mm -hmm. saying that some are but uh, there's a great deal of people who aren't interested in it and I think it is generally because they've got such a I'll be careful how I say this some people have a very low opinion of their nation's history oh. and as such that can that can create a great deal of negativity for histo aspects of history even if they don't belong to that yeah pre-national you know. exactly that's it this is pre-nations 
Uh, though saying that, the other side of it is they are exceedingly proud of what they do know. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, misinterpretation of the data. And there's uh, there's many, many websites online which push conspiracy theories and UFO theories as an explanation for this culture. Well, it's an alien, obviously. It is, seen, obviously. Have you not seen the X-Files? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that makes it extremely difficult to you've got to cut through the fat of the subject to get down to the lean stuff. Mm. And I think sometimes people either aren't interested or they don't have the time. And if um, if a, if a, if a nation for whatever reason can't put funding and money into promoting aspects of this history, it will just remain lost and and uh, left beneath the surface, yeah. almost literally. I don't yeah. know if that's a decent enough explanation for it. It's very hard to talk about the Balkans. Um, well, most of the audience you know. here is British and American. And I was okay. really asking mostly, I want to know about why we don't know, because I think the significance mm. of the Vinter culture is not uh, anything to do with uh, a, a re it's not a regional curiosity. No, it's a it's a, an unfolding of the human story of Very international so. relevance. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and it's just not like we people recognize the significance of Gebekli Tepe now. And it's yes. not been discovered very long ago. You've worked on a marvellous film which is going to make more people aware of the Vinci culture. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about how that came about? Sure. Uh, I've, I was working on a project actually at the time in Serbia that never came to fruition uh, for one reason or another over the past three years. I think you can imagine why. So um, I was chatting with my colleague who's a Serb and I, I said to him, look, listen, on my last trip to Serbia, um, I found out about venture culture. And I said, why don't we just do something on that? Keep it simple. Um, and, and he said, that sounds amazing. Let's just do it. Um, I had about six months to catch up on about 110 years worth of <laughs> development in the field. Yeah. Uh, and traveled out to Serbia on a shoestring. And um, that's basically how the whole thing came to fruition. Yeah. Uh, Vlad's passion for film and music meant that um, he was just more than happy to film the thing. Um, and he created the score for it as well. So that I was... love the score as well. I'm, oh, I'm, thank I'm, you. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, 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 got, it's got that lovely ancient quality to mm. it that mm. I think works, but it's got a sentimental quality, which mm. I think aids the documentary and makes it, makes it palatable, doesn't make it too heavy. And then with my own passion for history and my now sort of emerging passion for Vincia, it just made the documentary just an absolute labour of love. And we travelled pretty extensively, north, south, east and western Serbia. We had to stick to Serbia for, uh, for obvious reasons, but that's, that's the centre of Vincia anyway. Mm -hmm. So uh, we travelled from literally one archaeological site to another, sometimes sleeping in the car, sometimes in hostels or wherever. Um, it was uh, somebody asked me to to describe what the process was like. I said it was it's like a cross between Raiders of the Lost Ark and uh, uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. <laughs> it had that general kind of feeling about it. It's just us two in the car, yeah. um, and it it was in all seriousness though it was an unbelievable journey, um, and we got to meet literally some of the best people in the field, literally doing. Uh, the, doing all of all of that work all of the digging all of the excavations and you're meeting people um who have discovered some of the greatest neolithic finds ever we're talking figures and mm. and things like that some of the largest neolithic ceramic figures um i believe in the world incredible yeah it's the, the film is called the quest for venture and it can be it can be seen online, can't it? Uh, not yet. We've got to finish its festival run. I think it's it's on its like thirteenth festival or something. Mm -hmm. We've got to finish the festival run. Uh, then we're in negotiations with RTS, which is basically Serbia's version of the BBC, where it's going to be um, broadcast. Uh, and then it will be available online, I believe. Oh, so yeah. in it, it, it within a year, I hope. I okay. Hope. Well, watch yeah. this space. Watch yeah. this space, definitely. Um, yeah. Let's talk a bit more about some of these anthropomorphic figures. Mm -hmm. These weren't discovered until quite recently, were they? No, no that's it. That's it. Uh, so this this is a half scale version that I made of what's referred to as the Lady of Alexandrovats, and she she came out of the ground intact. She didn't need to be reassembled in any way. Perfectly preserved. 
Incredible. Um, and she's found in the locality of what's called Vitkovachko Polje, which are the Vitkovo fields, mm-hmm. uh, where there's a, a lot of agriculture. And uh, they grow grow vines for, for wine. It's a wine region. Mm-hmm. And she was found there. And she was uh, recently, one was discovered in 2019, which is double her size. So it's, it's, I mean, she's, she's almost life size. She's up. She's not about this big in reality. I could only do a small scale one. Um, but the other is, I think, I believe over 50 centimetres in height. And that's oh. the Vita figure. And it conforms to the same style. This is what they refer to as the serbo kosovan variants mm-hmm. of Vinci figures, which are the most ornate. It can't yeah. really be much other than an idol, I suppose. Yeah. I mean... Uh... What is it? Uh, what it could be? It would be otherwise. I I wrote a paper on them. Um, so I, uh, I, when I was producing these, I wanted to understand the the um, the skill and the craft that needed to be employed in order to physically make these. And it was actually an an amazing experiment in and of itself. But when you're left with these, where where do you put them? Where mm-hmm. do you put them? Where do they go? Um, what I realised was that they have to go into a space. They belong in a corner or they belong they belong in a space which they can dominate and and watch. Is there any from the context of the discovery, is there any clue as to how they were positioned or where they, where they, how they were used in, in, the, in the time of their life? Uh, we don't know. Many of them are found on what are basically seen as Neolithic rubbish heaps. Meaning that they might have been disposed of once they'd lived out their usefulness. Mm. Or maybe broken, because the venture didn't repair very much. Mm -hmm. If something broke, it was thrown away. Mm. Uh, And we do find that with figures. There could have been a ritualistic breaking of them, though. Because when you find broken figures, especially smaller versions, they're missing a head. You you can't find the head. You can Mm. find the body, but you don't find the head. As Mm. if they've sort of thrown it up or, you know, I don't know, off it offered it up to um, um, uh, offered it up to the winds or, or whatever you want to call it mm-hmm. uh, cast to the four winds but um, when we look at these when we look at these figures um, I won't I won't touch them but trust me when I say that on the backs of these there's barely anything which means that they're not supposed to be seen from behind mm-hmm. they're only supposed to be seen from the front and I've likened them to you know, like Byzantine icons. Yes. They take a presence in the room. It's like a window into heaven. Mm-hmm. And they're there to hold you to account, moral account. And that's how I see these. Mm. They sit there in judgment. They're very bossy as well. I mean, with the hands they, on their they, hips. They're found in proximity to settlements. Then. Completely. So they could, have been, they could have been sat in the in the domos, in the home, yep. uh, rather than in a, a, a dedicated temple. They could have been... Exactly. Uh, exactly. H- home. Yeah, that's very interesting. Besides the anthropomorphic Mm -hmm. uh, busts you also have these very peculiar uh, zoomorphic some are calling them owl figures or whatever they are what are these do you think (laughs) Uh, in an archaeological sense it's a prosopomorphic lid (laughs) right it's a lid it's a lid Uh, you find them uh, you either find them independently on their own but they're supposed to go on top of vessels one of the theories I heard is that uh, the reason they think they might be owls is that the vessels have found, they found trace elements of grain. And owls are the natural predators of mice. So they've obviously observed a bird of prey and probably thought, well, an owl's head is probably a very apt lid to have on, to, to keep our grain. I think it's very compelling speculation. Yeah. They do yeah. have an owl-like quality, sure. but... Uh, they could very well not be owls as well, but it's, so, uh, it could, it's very hard to tell what they are. Um, but yeah, the, the 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 relationship to the contents of the vessel is interesting. Is it certain that these vessels were all for grain? Then? Not all of them. No, well, there's trace elements found even of um, cannabis in some in some vessels. Cannabis. That's a very old example of cannabis. Yeah. yeah. What they were using it for, no one knows. At the moment you say that, people just want to say. Oh, they were obviously smoking it. There's no evidence to suggest they were doing that. But it was being pr- at least processed or something. Hemp rope. Is there any evidence of hemp clothing or anything? There's no evidence of clothes. All, it's all, all deteriorated. Anything that there was has deteriorated. The only thing we've got to go on are the figures to mm. tell us what kind of clothing they may have worn. Mm. Uh, well, But uh, even alcohol was present. Yeah. Alcohol, I would, my my uh, assumption would be that ritualistic alcohol, uh, beer, grains... 
you know, great fermented grains of some sort mm-hmm. were, were were a part of their culture because it's a, a, a an obvious thing. Yeah. Cannabis is more unusual, and I wouldn't I wouldn't have expected to learn that it was there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it would per- perfectly possibly be involved in some kind of ritual use. Sure. Um, part, some people say British archaeologists are the most the worst culprits in the world for being saying everything is ritual and uh, <laughs> everything's a, everything's a god. And everything is a, a ritual or object. And I, I'm not an archaeologist, but I'm as guilty of that as anyone. Put it this way. Uh, I've heard from everybody that these must be gods, though that's perfectly reasonable. It's perfectly plausible as well, though I also think that maybe they could be the idealised um, idealized form or a stylized form of community leaders, mm. quite possibly. Uh, they could be trying to portray a state of existence, mm. maybe, as well. When you look at this figure here, this is called the goddess on the throne. She has a slightly raised belly, mm-hmm. maybe indicating that she could be pregnant. Mm. When you look at the Lady of Alexandra Vats, now we don't know that these are feminine, though when I spoke with a, an actual modern sculptor, they said that shoulders in this configuration are extremely feminine when you're sculpting, even by today's standards. Yeah, they do give off a feminine vibe. They do. Although they're also quite ambiguous in, mm-hmm. in that respect. It's certainly not obvious. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they could well have been painted. And you can see sometimes on these, you find these little holes. Uh, something could have been placed in them. Maybe ha- uh, hair. Yes. Uh, Maybe a piece of rope or something to represent hair. Yeah, mm. that's exactly it. So uh, they, they form part of the mystery that people love when they study ancient cultures. And the figures are part of my, uh, one of the key aspects of my interest in Vincha culture, which was something that I was very keen to capture in the documentary. And we were so lucky to see the Vita figure because that museum was actually shut. So they let us in. So it was all boxed up in a crate ready for uh, conservation. So when we, whenever I get to see the figures, I don't know what it is, but they, I, this is subjective, I know, but they are magical. They are. they are magical. They have an enchanting quality. And it speaks of a people who've got an intricate nature um, and an intricate understanding of the human form and of and of beauty. Yeah, it's just shockingly advanced when you look at later um, examples that are just... Uh, I mean, anthropomorphic art is not... Uh, actually as widespread in, in Neolithic cultures as you'd think. Yeah, Some of them yeah, just yeah, yeah. didn't do it very frequently. Or if they did, most of it didn't survive mm-hmm. because it was in the wrong materials for preservation. We have scarce examples from Neolithic Britain. There's the corn dolly of Somerset, as it's called, uh, which is a small wooden, very crude idol, but it may have been less crude. There's um, a whalebone idol from the Orkney. Um, but there are not... Uh, I can't think of a single stone anthropomorphic idol from Neolithic Britain, uh, but there are plenty of plaque idols from Iberia, which are okay. vaguely anthropomorphic. And also some of them, although they're anthropomorphic, some people argue they're not humans, they're owls. So the same okay. problem happens there yeah, in yeah, the, yeah. Iberia, where the, there's an yeah. owl-like quality mm-hmm. to faces of the Neolithic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's another topic altogether. Yeah. How well has the film been received in film festivals and such? Really well. Really, we were so lucky to be featured in that we didn't win an award. That would have been just the uh, the, the the crown on the event, I think. Uh, we uh, but the, we were in the um, archaeological festival in Sicily, which is a pretty big a pretty big festival. Did you fly out for that? I was supposed to, but I couldn't make it in the end. So my oh. colleague had to uh, go. Poor him. Poor him. <laughs> uh, he said he drank too much grappa as well. I was like, oh damn, I missed out on that. Uh, but it's been really well received, especially in the east. Yeah. Romania. Uh, we won an award in Romania actually, um, and uh, it it just goes to show how um, how people re- are receiving it in in terms of. Um, in, in terms of it lighting up their imagination, because when we've spoken to people who have seen the documentary in Eastern Europe, when you get people coming up to you and shaking your hand and saying thank you, not bravo, but thank you, that's quite, it's, that, I say quite, it's actually exceedingly touching. So you're really touching, uh, you're, you're touching a soft spot in people with the subject. Even in England, when we screened it at festivals here, uh, people have been more blown away, like, I didn't even know anything about that. Every single aspect of what you were talking about was completely new. 
I think that's that, and that makes it special. I think. Yeah, it's so important because it's such a an enormous part of history that a significant part of history, mm-hmm. which is just not on most people's radar. That's and it. I guess that's why. And also, some of the people thanking you are thanking you for making them aware, and others are thanking you for making others aware because they, um, yeah. they are especially some. People from the region are probably very proud and want other people around the world to know about it. Somebody I know who's a doctor of doctor of archaeology and specialises in vintage ceramics. Mm-hmm. Uh, she lives she lives in Serbia. Uh, she when she saw the documentary, I was a little worried. I was hoping it was going to be received well by her. Um, she said, I, "I don't know where to start." I was like, "Uh oh!" And she says, "No, no." She said, "I don't know where to start." That's a medium that you could do so much with. And that could do so much for the subject. Mm. And I was like, well, I'm pleased, pleased you've said that because that's exactly, that's exactly what I think as well. And that's the beauty of documentary making. Mm. Uh, you, have to, you have to present it in an understandable format because when you write an academic paper, I mean, they can be stuffy unless you're really into the subject. Mm. So you have to touch on things very lightly and broadly, but also be factual at the same time. Yeah, they say you can... If you want no one to read it, then just make sure it's published in an academic journal. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> It'll be hidden yes. forever. But yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> what do you have any? I mean, growing up, have uh, and and in recent times, like, do you have influences in the world of historical documentaries that or styles of historical documentary that like made you think I can the best way for me to communicate Vincia is through video. Um, do you mean in terms of my what's inspired me? Yeah. Well, um, David Attenborough, and you know as well as I do, The Tribal Eye. The Tribal Eye is brilliant. Oh, that, yeah. that blew my mind when I saw it about six, seven years ago. Absolutely mm. blew my mind. The Tribal Eye is not historical documentary, but it is a documentary series by David Attenborough, commissioned by himself when he was in charge of the BBC <laughs> And uh, it's actually an anthropo- anthropological documentary about different human cultures, and I highly recommend it. Yeah. It's brilliant. It, it, it is absolutely incredible. And seeing that ground level uh, engaging with a subject, I mean, Dan Cruikshank, he's another one, that ground level of really engaging with something that's not actually just in a museum uh, or being held with white gloves. Mm. where you're actually involved almost in the very process of things being discovered. That's in, always the, a... in the film, you do that. You, he visits the sites where it's believed there was uh, extraction of metals and he's scampering up the mountainside <laughs> yeah. and uh, you, you, you're going to the archaeological sites and yeah. looking at the people as they're digging and, and, and they're uncovering and finding bits of pottery as you're there. So it's yeah. very tactile, uh, hands-on documentary. Completely. When you do that, when you, but when you present that and you give that to somebody to watch, mm. you hope that they want to feel as though they're there as well. Mm-hmm. There's that bit where I'm climbing up the mountain and everyone goes, like that, there's no ropes and I've got a pair of smart boots on. You know? And they're like, like oh, God, you know, the thought that you might have slipped or something. Uh, and then, again, when we're walking, I think we're at the site of Grivats or Kragovats, I forget which one, uh, Dr. Miroslav Kocic, who's you know, one of the big names in, in, in this subject, he found, he found a half a polished stone axe head just lying in the topsoil, just picked it up. Remarkable. And it is absolutely remarkable. I've, um, I even brought home some bits and bobs from one of those sites. He said, help yourself, he says, because when we do, a, um, uh, um, we do uh, surface excavations, a single archaeologists could find a thousand pieces within one square meter of of uh, material culture fragments yes but about a thousand pieces on, on real levels of uh, the density of archaeological uh, finds in this field uh, yeah. are so impressive and it's really brought home in the documentary because they're just walking around in a field and they're like oh there's some but that and then that's how you reach the obvious conclusion that this is a, pro, a, a production, a centre of production. If I can say this, this is the bit that really excites me, is the industrial scale in which they were producing ceramics on all levels of both utility and beauty. Mm-hmm. When you do soil analysis of the sites, you can actually find the borders of settlements, the very edge or the periphery of a settlement, because the soil composition has changed through mass industry. 
Mm -hmm. So the mass production of ceramics has changed the nature of the soil so that you can actually see where a settlement ends and where woodland begins. Incredible. Uh, when you do further soil analysis of venture sites, I think there's sulfates or sulfites in the soil which indicate deteriorating matter. You don't find anything, very small trace elements, um, but you barely find any of those sulfites in, in domestic settings. Is it ash from the kilns and things like that that they're, they're throwing out into the peripheries of the settlement? It's possible. It's possible, but the sulfites indicating uh, deteriorating matter and, and a lack of it means that they must have some uh, waste management. Uh, we, always, we always attribute this time to people being sort of filthy and dirty, but these people must have understood the nature of cleanliness mm. in order that we can't really find what they were doing with all of their waste. I, I mean, once you decide you're going to live in a fixed location and not be a, a, a nomadic, you, you, cut, you need some system of waste management or you'll, die, or you'll die very quickly. So I'm sure that yeah. part of the early agricultural package, uh, including the things that we can look at in the archaeological and genetic records, such as pottery and domesticated grains, includes things we can't, like waste management, there must have been a way of getting all the uh, human waste away from the settlement. Precisely. Mm. And we know that from sites like Stublina, when you do geophysical surveys, we can see that, and I, I, don't, use, I don't mean to use the word roads or, or streets, because that's, that's a modern term, but we can see that when they were building, building up their settlements, you can see almost grid-referenced plots for domestic settings, and you can even find what could be communal spaces, large open spaces within or surrounded by potential domestic settings. So these people were planning the places that they built. And we see we see early planning going back to the late Meso Mesolithic as well on sites like Lepensky Veer. I, mm -hmm. won't, I won't get into all of that, mm -hmm. uh, but there are links between the two, especially on a genetic level. Um, so when we uh, when we look at Vincia, we're seeing this this we're seeing the beginning of our modern era today, mm. with fixed and planned settlements, industry, agriculture, we're still we're still living, but we're living in an advanced version of what they created. Yeah, except uh, I think it should be added that there isn't necessarily a, di a direct line between us and them because sure. it seems that these advancements of the Vinci culture, many of them seem to have gone disappeared and then come back again. Mm -hmm. uh, I know the Kukuteni Tupilia cultures had planned what looked like planned urban centres almost, yeah. but in Romania, in the Neolithic, a uh, uh, fair bit after Vinci, but still in the late Stone Age. But then that all stops, and the majority of settlements across Neolithic Europe are nothing like urban, uh, nothing, nothing that could not be called urban. The, the dominant culture of Neolithic Europe throughout most of it, I'd say, really ended up being the one that most of us descend from is the LBK of Central uh, Europe and uh, that ha had some apparent uh, custom, I'm not sure why, of burning down their home, their homes from time to time. And which is what the Vinci did. No, do you have any theories about why that might have been? I do. Uh, it, it's just a theory, so, uh, and there's many theories on the subject. Uh, it could have been one, a possible invasion into the area of other peoples who could have been inherently warlike, maybe proto-Indo-Europeans. The thing is, though, you don't find any human remains as a consequence. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no, uh, you, when you do the, uh, the analysis of, there's very limited bones of Vinci people. We, we find that you find very little in the way of uh, necropolis, but uh, you don't see, what you do find, people haven't died violently doesn't seem to be like a heavy blow or strike to the head or anything like that. Mm -hmm. The other theory is that there could have been a widespread plague. Mm. And these people would have had extremely uh, advanced pyrotechnology. They would have understood the nature of fire and its purifying capabilities. And they could well have just burnt their settlements to the ground and moved on. Mm. Because when you correlate, obviously in a chronological sense, when you look at the end of the Vinci period, so it spanned a... Roughly about a thousand years, just shy of a thousand years. When you look at the that's end, an enormous. That's a very long lived <laughs> yeah, culture. Let's just put yeah. that in there because uh, most yeah. archaeological cultures don't last that long. No, no, this is exactly it. 
and you're looking at them ending around 4,200. Around that same time, you see the spread of Neolithic technologies across across and into Western Europe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you can actually make that link when they burn the settlements and then Neolithic technologies start to appear in a more, adv in a more advanced state mm. in Central Europe. Besides your mm. replica, mm -hmm. uh, your replicas, which you make, and I'm sure that's given, the process of making them itself is, provides insight into the culture mm. because sometimes mm. that hands-on process. But you also have acquired for yourself a collection of uh, real Vinter artifacts, have. haven't you? Uh, ones that I've either been gifted or ones that I've, uh, I've purchased from antiquity dealers. And I have, and um, they range from vessels, fragments of vessels, and even down to a very tiny little tool, which is uh, what we call a microblade, normally like flint napping. Um, but the, uh, the vessels that are found sometimes come with incised markings, and it's those incised markings that lead people to think that they could well have been a very early form of the written language in Venture. But That's I don't. Controversial. But I don't agree with that. Let's talk about that. The vi this is called the <laughs> Venture script. Yeah. What's the Venture script, and why do people think it might be writing? What is the Venture script? It's sometimes called the Nubian script, and it's a collection of symbols that have been um, brought together uh, that have been found on ceramic vessels and sometimes found on figures. And they can be all sorts of different things from what could be perceived to be solar or lunar symbols, symbols that look like plants, symbols uh, even like the swastikas found in Venture, uh, all, all sorts of symbols that look like animals. And people believe that it is some form of early written language. The only reason people think that, though, is because somebody smart, I don't know who it was, just compiled all of the symbols together and just put them all together together. Um, I don't know that you can find them online if you look them up. Look up, look up Venture symbols or Danubian script, and it looks as though they've compiled an alphabet. Mm. But there's symbols from all different periods of Venture culture all jumbled up together, so you can't you can't ascertain anything from that. So you can't ascertain from these jumbled up examples of yeah. the script from diverse different sources, ceramic yeah. sources, whether those would actually have, you know, comprised a script, and. In uh, do are there any actual individual artifacts where the symbols on them could have constituted a script? There are very few examples, but there are. So when you when you come down to understanding a written language, you can't do it by just finding one isolated little symbol. It has to be a string or a line of symbols, and that might mean something. So when they made the discoveries of the Tartaria tablets in Romania, which is attributed to Vinci culture, and they're basically three uh, ceramic tablets uh, that have something akin to some form of symbology on them that could be hinting at some kind of meaning. Though, again, I don't feel that it's... It is a collection of symbols in that sense, but I don't know whether it's actually a written language with, with a syllabic value. That's mm. the point. It, it certainly doesn't seem to from my understanding, I'm not a linguist, mm. that it, it cannot possibly constitute a phonetic script because of the, the way that the symbols are not combined in a consistent way where you'd see like exactly. uh, vowels and whatever. So it's not phonetic. And um, it, whether the symbols do have, can be combined in a way that would make, you know, sentences or, 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 or complex concepts, that's debatable. But then the question of what is a, a script sort of brings up because... This is it. Uh, if I if I put a McDonald's logo in inside a no sign, that clearly makes a a, a concept of anti McDonald's. Uh, but those we wouldn't normally consider the the anti sign and the McDonald's sign combined to constitute a sentence. But uh, yeah. com combining sentences, uh, combining symbols can evoke com complicated concepts. But does that mean it's a, a script? I don't think so. Are they conveying meaning? Of course they are, because mm. the Vinture seem to want to convey meaning on all levels of what mm. they're producing. I mean, mm. that conveys meaning. Yes. It has to. Even the swirls on the, on, on the belly, it's conveying, conveying some kind of meaning. Certainly. Um, but, you know, when you look, and I urge people actually, look up the Tartaria tablets. Make, you know, come to your own conclusions about them. Because to me, when I look at them, 
I see lunar symbols and plant symbols and symbols um, that are or, or figures that are almost like animals. And these people are farmers. So you live by your 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 livestock, by the crops, the way you may rotate them, lunar cycles. Maybe that's something, you know, something is being conveyed there. Mm. But those symbols do not have a syllabic value that we know of. Mm. And there's nothing to suggest that they do. If they were a script, mm -hmm. <laughs> which you, you don't think they are, and I don't think it's a script either, but yeah. if they were a script, it would be the oldest script in the world? It would be the oldest known script. So mm. Fincher is 5,300. There are symbols. BC. Uh, BC, yeah. sorry. Yes, BC. Uh, <laughs> so, so over 7,000 years ago. Yeah, and that would predate cuneiform mm. and Egyptian hieroglyphs. Wow. And so, bearing in mind that they predate the pyramids, they predate, or, or I should say, Vincher predates the pyramids, it predates Babylon. Yeah. This is the dawn of history. If it had a script, it would be the oldest. Probably doesn't, but okay. It's got some kind of symbology, complex use of symbology. One of, one of if not the earliest example of metallurgy, certainly independently invented and not dependent on somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, it's part of the a, a constellation of different cultures which are the earliest farmers in Europe and it has what the largest anthropomorphic neolithic uh, ceramic figures. figures figures not just ceramics figures of, of Europe that I'm that I am aware of and I've tried to do an extensive study of it and the largest one is the Vita figure you'll find mm. it online yeah. And where's the Vita figure? That's the, from, from Vinter culture. That comes from the same site as the Lady of Alexandrovats. And um, it's found, yes, on Vitkovačko Polje or the Vitkovo fields. There are uh, the Sugir idol, as it's called, I think. Uh, there's, a, there's a very, very old uh, wooden uh, sculpture of a, a, a god or a figure of mm -hmm. some kind from R Russia. Uh, which is much older than this, but mm -hmm. that wooden. But I mean, uh, so yeah, that, that might be the, the oldest. But and I'm not sure what the oldest. But this kind of ceramic figures certainly are not. And uh, of, and, and and certainly of high high precision and high detail. The Vita figure they've done analysis of it, and it is perfectly is not perfectly, but almost perfectly symmetrical, and it's been made by hand. Beautiful. And that just, I mean, these. Pale in comparison, because these people have, uh, they have had about, you know, a thousand years to develop an art form. I've, I've just had to just sort of do this from, um, from scratch in the past couple of years. But you can see, if I can achieve that, go and look up the Vita figure, because that's just... And it's did the process of, of creating these and did it what other insights did it give you into the way that they would have, if there's a production process as it was in the olden times? They took time. They took time to produce, and they were made up in layers. You you literally start at the base, and these arms. I've half theorised that the arms being in this configuration could actually be in the interests of structural integrity, right. because if you don't have this the integrity of the arms here, it causes the top section of the torso to slump during the drying process. Mm. So. It could have been a, a practicality that then became a cultural trope, but that again just a theory. Um, the head is the final thing that has to go on again because it's fairly uh, it, it's a sort of a top down so no, a, a, a bottom up construction method that seemed to work out to be the the most practical way of of producing these mm. um, and do you need it to dry as you're building it up then partially mm -hmm. the details have to go in far later on because otherwise they just become sloppy. Mm -hmm. It's got to be a little firmer in order to take the incised impressions mm -hmm. um, or the incised markings. So, so there's that aspect to it. Also, I found that it's almost a ritual process in and of itself to make one. Mm -hmm. um, I tried, uh, again, subjective, but I tried a, a variety of different, um, a, a variety of different music when I made each one to oh. see if it lent any kind of um, lent any like anything additional to the process of making them, and it genuinely does. Mm -hmm. uh, so there could have been a ritual process in the in the making of them as well. That would not surprise me in the slightest. Mm. I, and there are certainly anthropological examples where that is the case in different cultures. And mm -hmm. what people in ancient times would call the sunthamata, the the like the and the the, the divine forces into the idols and making them in the form that was 
welcoming to the presence of that God was essential. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I, I could imagine devotional hymns being sung in the creation of them or, or who knows what, whether they had to be created in a special environment or with clay sourced from a sacred river or something of this kind. Like, of course. The entire process could be utterly imbued with the, with the sacral from start to finish. Well, you can find that, um, again, that, I mean, it brings me on to this, which is that with regards to the copper mines of Rudmaglava, uh, they, found, they found altars there that could be ibex, in the shape of ibex, and it's a very hilly and mountainous region, which is where ibex live. Mm. So maybe in the process of mining for copper ores, azurite and malachite, they're honouring something in the process of doing that. The ibex could even be a symbol of, of that region for them, maybe something on a spiritual level. Interesting. Poss possibly, possibly. Well, the, the presence of the, the, you know, the mountains, so if they had a celestial god, which many cultures do, mm -hmm. then that would be, the you know, ibex would be an obvious sort of link to the celestial, perhaps, as being a mountain-dwelling creature. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not aware of how the Vinci disposed of their dead. Is much known about that? There isn't. Very little. There are sites, uh, such as Gomolava, where you find... Um, where you find Vincha remains and actual graves with grave goods, ceramic grave goods. But there's, um, they all seem to be an anomaly. Some are men, some are women and some are children, which means that they might well have been um, of some communal or community or social importance that they were buried like that because you don't find them like that really on any other site. They found the craniums of human beings on venture sites in in um, in ditches or, or or things akin to moats, and that was only in the only in the last year or so. I only found out about that from the guy who actually discovered them this time last summer. So that's but nobody knows why. Do you mean that they were discarded in a, in, in a ditch? Like they don't know. They've just found the 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 tops of tops of human skulls. Could be sacrificial victims or quite possibly or punished criminals or yeah. victims in a conflict not really certain on that but so there's no clues about social stratification from burial customs not really not not like you would find in something like we were saying varna culture or gumelnitsa culture and gumelnitsa mm. culture is contemporaneous with vincha mm. but only towards its latter stage and again with gumelnitsa culture you find very rich grave goods mm. but you don't see that in vincha no you don't see that at all um, but there are other clues perhaps about the social stratification well when it comes to when it comes to copper that could be a, uh, a mark of prestige uh, within that culture. And it, they actually think that, that the, the characteristics of the copper period in Vincha, wherever we see it, could have instigated a class system. Mm. It could have been, because there are several theories, obviously. Some people obviously saying that copper was there at the very beginning, mm -hmm. or maybe it was only at the beginning on certain sites. Um, or that copper did come later, and it was because of the copper and the class-based systems that it potentially created. In, in other words, creating hierarchy mm. that could have actually put play to the people themselves. Mm. Uh, though and there are so many theories on that, and I think that's that's actually worth emphasising, is what I love about studying Vincia is it's still anybody's game. Mm. It's not like Egypt or Greece or Rome or anything like that, where, of course, you can still build a career on it. Of course you can. You can still make amazing discoveries. This, it's still so mysterious, you can you could build a lifetime's worth of work on it. Yeah, any young archaeology students yeah. wondering what they ought to devote their <laughs> lives to, well, get yourself over to Serbia yeah, and, uh, and definitely. get involved with this fascinating subject. And there's plenty of archaeologists out there at the top of their game, and they are looking for a new influx of foreign archaeologists into that into that area because it promotes what they're doing but it also uh, it furthers our development and our understanding really of who these people were well said ben well thank you very much hey, for, for my the pleasure interview. it's been a pleasure talking to you yeah. this has been jive talk if you want to watch the film as ben said it's not quite available for public mm -hmm. consumption yet but it will be i'll let you know yeah, yeah. Uh, and i'll add it if you're watching this in the in a year's time then you'll probably see that i've already added a link to the video in the description. Uh, otherwise, is there anywhere, anywhere else people can keep up to date with your work besides... 
Uh, you can find my academic papers on academia.edu. Uh, I have a LinkedIn account, Benjamin Elliott. You can find me on there and that will keep people up to date with what I'm working on, uh, which is we're working on a new documentary at the moment, just waiting for funding. So I'm updating people as we go there. I don't have a, a social media presence outside of that mm -hmm. um, somewhat of a recluse in that regard cool. uh, but um, I can uh, yeah if you follow me on my LinkedIn account and things you'll see what I'm up to all the time okay I'll put those links in the description thanks for watching goodbye